Broadcasting from the abandoned food court at the White Flint Mall, it's the Nice Guys on Business podcast. Need an education on how to grow your business? The Nice Guys are here to help. Learn about great customer service, networking, and how just being nice can help you prosper. Now, here are your hosts, Doug Sandler and Strickland Bonner. Hey, nice guy community. Welcome back. Welcome back. Today we have a guest because it is Friday. Hey, Friday, yes. Friday, Friday. Mr. Friday. Alex Plaxon. Hey, introductions first. My name is Strickland Bonner. And on the other side of the microphone, Mr. Doug Sandler. Good afternoon, everybody. Friday. Hey, how do you drive know time. it's afternoon for them? Well, it's, it's drive time. No matter where, it's drive time. I, w- I was thinking morning, it's drive time. I hope it's morning like they li- listen to us in the morning to get motivated. Well, I would do the uh, I would do the good morning Vietnam thing, but um, it's you know the uh, if you don't know that reference, uh, ask your parents. <laughs> but but good morning Vietnam, very very popular movie. How many years ago do you think that movie came out? Oh, geez, it's got to be twenty twenty five years ago now. Yeah, Robin. There's a great Williams. line when when Seth um, McFarlane. That's it, Seth McFarlane. Right? <laughs> when Seth McFarlane a couple years ago, he he hosted the Oscars, yeah. and everybody said. Hey, everybody, check it out. Um, this is Seth MacFarlane, and I'm hosting the Oscars next week. If you don't know who Seth MacFarlane is, ask your kids. If you don't know what the Oscars are, ask your parents. <laughs> yeah, very, very, very true. I don't even remember why we got on the Ask Your... Oh, good morning, Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. So I, it's it's early. We're recording this episode very early, much earlier than we would normally re- record it in the, in the daytime, not in the week. And uh, I'm just trying to get my wheels under me from my brain. So it is Friday right now, and it is uh, Alex Plaxon Day. And uh, Alex owns a company called Little Bird Told Me Media, I believe. Is that the name of his company, well, official name of his company? Little Bird Told Media, like as in a little bird told me, little bird told media. But what uh, I love about uh, Alex that is- play of words. So right, nice. exactly. So he is a consulting firm focused on social media strategy. But what's interesting is it's specifically for- conferences, which is great because, you know, there's so many companies out there that are doing social media strategy and how do you get more interest and all that. He focuses specifically on conferences, which, you know, when we did our nice guy uh, mastermind, you know, we didn't get quite the interest that we would have liked. We could have used Alex maybe. Well, Alex does a great job. I met Alex through uh, Meeting uh, Meeting Professionals International, MPI, and um, I immediately, at, even at a young age, Alex, I think, was in his either his mid or his late 20s when I met him. And I, I, the first meeting I went to with MPI, I, I was just completely captivated by the amount of attention that was given to Alex. He was like he was like the the uh, the MPI darling. So I'm walking into this room. I'm sitting down to go to the meeting, and um, and I'm watching on stage. And Alex is basically winning every award, every accolade, every everything. And I'm thinking, who the fuck is this guy? Well, he's still <laughs> in his twenties because he won the industry association for top twenty in their twenties class. I think I think he may. Uh, he could be 30 as of the airing of this episode. I'm not, a, we didn't record it that long ago, but I think that I, maybe I could be wrong. I'd so look up his young. exact birthday, but he is definitely a young guy, but forget the, uh, the youth thing, the idea of the level of experience that he has, all of the meeting planners at MPI, they want a little piece of Alex and, uh, and he's willing to provide, he's really, really great with communication, great with building relationships. Uh, he's on the board at MPI, uh, here locally, the Potomac chapter here in DC. He's just a, a well thought of, um, well seasoned, uh, guy for a young guy. And, um, yeah, for sure. He's a, he's a guy that you want to uh, take a listen to and, and listen to what he actually has to say, because it is sage advice for his, uh, for his age. So if you do plan conferences, if you try to promote conferences, it's a great one to listen to. But as I always say, if there's some little tidbit of something that you get out of it, it's worth listening to. So even if you don't do conferences, there's so much information about social media that can really apply to just about anything to try to get you more attention. So it's totally worth listening to. No, absolutely. So take a take a moment and uh, don't forget if you have not had a chance to review the show, please. We are uh, we are noticing that there are a lot of people that are no longer reviewing the shows. Now it's not a one time thing, and you don't have to do it anymore. Maybe it is on iTunes that way. But if you are listening on Overcast, please just click on the show art right behind the show art. There's a little bu- uh, button that says recommend. Hit the recommend button, and uh, and you will greatly be helping us because uh, right now we are in the fourth position, of course, by, behind uh, Tim Ferriss and two other MP. <laughs> two other NPR podcasts, but we want to be uh, we want to be back in the top three again. So take a moment and do that, Strick. You know, because I would we love- know you're listening on Overcast as ninety three percent of you are. 
Yeah, yeah, this is crazy. It is crazy. We, I, I'm never going to give up on the idea of that we can actually have a um, an iTunes audience, but it's not, it's not looking good right now. I know it's really not. I think we I talked about that. Oh yeah, either yesterday or Tuesday, we're going to be talking about that on on our show that we haven't recorded yet. Wait, we haven't recorded Tuesday's show yet, and it's Friday. Right, what exactly. Happened? How did we do that? It's our time machine. No, I'm sure something like that. Well, let's deliver the promise statement and then get to our interview with Alex. The nice guy's promise statement right here. Hold us to that standard. If we don't reach that standard, if we do and you love us and you want to just tell us, please reach out. At, at DJ Doug is, uh, is my Twitter handle. That guy over there, Strick, at nice guy on biz with a Z. So um, are you ready to get to our interview with Alex? Yeah, I think. Let's get to it. Mr. Alex Plaxen. Alex Plaxon, president and founder of Little Bird Told Media, began his events career while studying at George Washington University, uh, but I best know him for his amazing efforts with an association here in D.C. called Meeting Professionals International. It's actually an international agency or association, but uh, he does a lot of work with the Potomac chapter here, serving as the board on the board of directors. As, um, as the head man, though, at Little Bird Told Media, uh, it's a consulting firm focusing on social media strategies and implementation uh, at conferences as well. Alex is an influencer for sure on social media and recently named uh, by an industry association as top 20 in their 20s class of 2016. Finally, I didn't screw up the intro at all. Your parents will be proud. Alex Plaxon, <laughs> welcome to the show. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for having me. Man, it's, it's, it's my pleasure. You know, it's, it's, um, every time we would run into each other at the, uh, at the chapter meetings, uh, I kept promising you we'll get you on the show, and you probably thought, man, this guy is so lame. He keeps promising, but he doesn't deliver. So I'm finally I'm able to deliver, so thanks, Alex, for being here. No, no, I'm, gl- I'm glad to uh, finally be here. Yeah, you know, I'm coming up on uh, almost a year since I decided to, uh, to break out on my own so it's, it's good timing that's incredible i can't believe it's already been a year it just seems like yesterday you were saying goodbye to the uh to the regular job and although I'm, i know you enjoy the regular job and i even know your old boss uh it's got to be a huge level of satisfaction to be able to do your own thing you know it is um i always kind of pictured myself in this role but there was definitely some fear like can i actually do this mm-hmm. um but, you know, we're a year in, and uh, I, I wouldn't change a thing. I love doing it, and uh, it's, it's exciting. It's absolutely gratifying, and, um, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity that for the right person, the right role, it's exactly what they should be doing. And I think statistically, they say if you get beyond your first year that has an 80% fail rate, all you got to do is get past the uh, the next 10% because then there's a 90% fail rate in the second year. So <laughs> not not to taboo what's going on, but man, you are uh, you are turning up the gain. And I love seeing all your posts and I love hear, hearing all the positive feedback. Maybe it's because we're both in the same industry to a degree with MPI that, uh, that I hear about you a lot, but I know you're a mover and shaker. And even at a young age, I mean, you really understood, help me with because this is really where I want to lead in. In an early age, you really understood the importance of a network. So can you share a couple of secrets about not only just growing your network online, which you have a pretty big community of, but talk about it offline also. Can you? Can we start there? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I was very fortunate. In undergrad, I actually planned to be in the film industry. Um, I did set design for film. And I learned very early on that if you did not network, you didn't work. Um, most people hired the people that they knew. Um, it was very rarely someone coming to you who had no idea who you were, had no idea the work that you had done. Who's like, Hey, I want to hire you. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I don't think that's unique to the film industry. Um, no, not at all. It's like the unique to every industry, (laughs) but you know, it's, it's very hard in the film industry to send anyone your resume and be like, Hey, hire me to, to do a job because, When you break out, you know, beyond film school, it it really is who you know. So when I graduated, um, I realized that very quickly, (laughs) that despite working on um, an Oscar-nominated film and and for, you know, I consider my resume to be pretty top-notch out of film school, uh, I didn't know anyone down in L.A., and so it made it very hard to find a job. So when I decided, you know, a few years later to go to grad school and study event and meeting management, which had actually been a passion of mine since I was in eighth grade, um, planning conferences and things for my uh, youth group in high school. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I, I realized very quickly, okay, I'm not going to make the same mistake twice. Let me get as involved as possible in the industry associations. And so day one of grad school, um, where I was studying event and meeting management, I asked a second year student, I said, okay, what are the associations I need to join? And I joined them immediately. I got involved. I volunteered my time. And, and that's how I developed the network that I have. And if I didn't have that network, there's no way that I could have branched out on my own. And, and Nice Guy Community, just as you're listening to this, know that Alex, hello to you, Alex. You're in like your early 20s or mid 20s, aren't you? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I'm, I turned 30 this year. No, I was going to, no, you can't be 30. <laughs> you can't be. You're, you're still like that, that 20s. So I've known you for a few years. So I guess maybe you were in your mid 20s when I, uh, when I first met you. What's yeah. so amazing is to know Alex, to know that he got involved in the association at, a, at pro, when you were, how old were you? That's when you were in your I, early I, 20s. I was Right. Probably 26 when I first joined. Oh, okay. So you're still still in your mid 20s. So even yeah. at 26 years old, Alex came off the line. Now it, it, keep in mind, nice guy community. Those that are in the the event industry um, and the meetings world, it, it's a very niche industry. Very tough. Not only not being a woman in that business, um, but uh, but being young as well, because it is a, such a a, a female influenced environment. So Alex comes in, he's in his mid-20s, he's a guy, he's friendly, he's like totally like, uh, you know, what I would be if I was in that industry in my mid-20s, just like totally like a mama's boy. And, and it's like, they ate him up. I mean, they loved it. The minute that you got in the industry, they, they, they just, they love, I know, didn't they love you the minute that you got in or, or am I? It, it, am I-, I think it's, I think it's the baby face too. Everyone wanted to, uh, t- take care of me <laughs> yeah everybody wanted to take care of alex they all they all wanted to have him over for dinner they all wanted to make sure they fixed him up with the right person you know it's all the all the great stuff when and, and he entered it in as a he came into it as a student also which again as soon as you come in as a student everybody that is older than you that's that's uh, seasoned in the industry thinks that you don't know jack shit and it was the exact opposite actually when i joined the association Let's see, I'm 52, so I joined it probably at 49. When I joined at 49, one of the first people that I met on the first day that I was there was you. And I see, and I watched this guy, and I'm like, you were in your mid-20s, and I thought you were in your early 20s at that point. In my mind, I'm thinking, holy shit, this guy has got his act together. All I'm going to do, and I think I told you this that night, Alex, maybe that first night I met you, I said... All I'm going to do is everything that you've already, that you've done. I'm just going to. Didn't I say something like I'm going to follow you? You must have thought, who is this creepy old man? Uh, everything except the creepy old man part. Yes, that's, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, I, I just felt like I. Th- how did you have it? How did you have the secret to having it all, or what seemed to have it be having it all together at such a young age in an industry that is influenced by the another the opposite sex with total experience how did you even make it in that in that environment you know one of the things that everyone told me when i first joined because there's a bunch of committees that you can volunteer for everyone said volunteer your time i said okay absolutely but everyone said join the student outreach committee now, I was already involved with the student um, organization at my university. Uh, I was vice president of events or something like that mm-hmm. at the time. And so I said, I don't want to do more student outreach. That's not going to benefit me. All I'm going to do is meet more students. Right, um, right. It, it's something I'm passionate about now is student outreach. But at the time, I knew that if I wanted to stand out, I needed to do something different. I needed to go somewhere where there were no student volunteers. That way, even if I did very minimal work, which is not the case, I did a lot of work, but even if I did very minimal work, I would get noticed. And so what happened was I took on a role. They needed someone to be responsible for organizing a certain part of the, the committee. And so I took on that role. It, it wasn't a lot of work, but it was an important role. Mm-hmm. And from there, people started to know who I was. And it was a role that required me to communicate with other people. Right, I, joined right. the mar- I joined the marketing committee because I knew that that committee had to interact with all the other committees. So it was very strategic. And by doing that, I started to meet all the other people in leadership roles. And I went to an event and... It was their annual awards, and I saw someone who I knew because she was in charge of student outreach. 
uh, win this Rising Star Award. Right, right. And and I went up to someone who was one of the first people I met in the industry. Uh, her name was Amy O'Malley, and I said, "Amy, next year that award's going to be mine." Nice. I and think she's very said, similar to what I said to you. I think <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So she said, "Okay, okay, we'll see, we'll see." And uh, that week, she sent me an email telling me that there were scholarships available to go to the annual conference for meeting professionals international worldwide. And it was in Vegas that summer. And so it was at the end of my first year of grad school. And she goes, I strongly encourage you to apply for this scholarship. Mm -hmm. Essentially hinting that if I applied, I'd probably get it. Right. And that's exactly what happened. And so when I went as a student to this conference that was international, I made sure to latch on to the important people who I recognized as doing big things in our local chapter, and they introduced me to everyone else, and it just kind of snowballed from there. So as a, as a guy that understands the importance of, uh, of offline networking, meaning not, not on the internet, not through social media, because that's, that's even your business, so that's got to be like the easy part. Did you find that the offline part, um, actual face-to-face human interaction, was that... Was that challenging for you, or was it just something that you just said, hey, I just got, I don't care if it's challenging, I just have to do it? You know, I've always been a pretty extroverted person. Uh, I, I always tried to take on leadership roles, so I wouldn't say that it was challenging, but what was the challenge was after I graduated, which was now, you know, I'm 28 years old, I have a master's degree in event and meeting management. How do I now convince these professionals who, like you said, like they wanted to take care of me and all that, how do I now convince them that I am a real professional, I'm not a student anymore, and how can I get them to take me seriously? And, and, and that has been the challenge more than the other part. Yeah, yeah, but you know what I find is really interesting in, in knowing you and in, in looking at your involvement in the association – um, I think now the playing field has been equalized, and now you just have the same challenges that we that we all have, which is how do we take a an association that's filled with volunteers and people thinking that you're now just a, an integral part of the association, but they don't really see you as a a marketing or a an influence, and not necessarily. I mean, I think a lot of people do, but maybe not the people yet that are sharing. People are and not enough people are seeing it and providing you business. So how do you make the turn? So how do you make the turn from Somebody that is okay. So now they know that I'm a good worker. I'm in MPI, and people love me, and they know me, and all that, and that's great stuff for you. How do you challenge? How do you turn that into actual dollars coming in your door now? <laughs> how do I make money? Because right. uh, <laughs> isn't that so, isn't that the goal of these of of networking? And and well, maybe the goal is to build relationships, but ultimately it has to pay your bills as well. Yes, it does, and. The way that I've done that is not necessarily reaching out to my network to be my clients, but reaching out to them to introduce me to people who are my clients. Oh, that's a good For point. example, you know, I've built some strong relationships. I know who the power players are in the industry, and I have nurtured those relationships. So I get called for interviews. And people asking me, hey, can you give me a quote about this? And in one year, year, I have, you know, started to get some speaking engagements and things like that. So it's been less about getting the business from the people I know, but more getting the opportunities to get leads for business from the people I know. How do you how do you find that um, my whole strategy has always been since this new business, the speaking business, four years ago or whatever has has started? How have you found that the idea of growing your business as an expert in your industry has worked for you? Because I know that you really have done a really good job of um, of aligning yourself as the expert in in your world. So, I mean, what I do, which is social media strategy and implementation for conferences, is a very niche uh, thing. It is a new service that most people are not doing. There's not many people out there doing what I do. So to convince people, hey, pay attention to me, this is something you should be paying money for, Mm -hmm. um, and not just hiring some intern off the street to handle your social media strategy for your conference, right? (laughs) Um, has been difficult. And what I've realized very quickly was that the people I was convincing and seeing that kind of spark and, and you can kind of see the gears turning in their head, like, 
oh, he actually knows what he's talking about, and maybe I'm not thinking about this in the right way. Right. Um, it, it's all been face to face. Um, so that so, that that network that that the building of your tribe has all been uh, has all been face to face. Very rare. I mean, I I don't know your business specifically, but I would have to assume based upon what you're telling me that it's it's coming from you having a a face to face human interaction with people. Exactly, which is why I knew that you know this first year, and I really figured out maybe three months into this that if I wanted the business, I needed to be speaking. And I needed to be educating people in our industry about why this new service is important. Really cool. Really interesting. So give me some secrets on the other side of it to growing your online network, because although that may not be necessarily the area where you're going to get a lot of business from, or specifically any business from, um, there are a lot of people in the Nice Guy community that have online business. And one of the things that you do as a social media strategist um, is you help drive people to conference websites. You help get people to to using you know use the hashtags at the conference and to understand what the, what the relevance is of actually using social media to their advantage when they're having conferences to promote. Um, how do you grow your network that way? Uh, I started doing this about three years ago. It was really that first conference that I, industry conference I went to in Vegas. Um, I had had a Twitter account. I had been active on social media. But one thing that I had never done was live tweet a conference. Um, it was really the first conference that I had seen that had a hashtag. Mm-hmm. And they had like a leaderboard up on a screen and people were going to see who, oh, who posted the most photos, who did the most retweets, things like that. And so I was like, huh, so people are like actually using this. And so I would sit there in educational sessions and I would start tweeting out quotes that the speakers were saying. Mm -hmm. And I would follow the hashtag on Twitter and what I realized was that other people in other rooms were also sharing quotes yeah. from the speakers. I was like, wait a second. I no longer have to choose between 10 sessions that are going on at the same time. I can actually get educated about all the different content going on at the same time by sh- essentially sharing notes on Twitter right, right. Uh, using, <laughs> using this hashtag. And so what ended up happening is I would see someone else tweeting about another session and I would send them a tweet and I'd say, hey, thanks so much for these notes. These were fantastic. Um, you know, what session are you going to next? Uh, <laughs> let's make sure we don't go to the same session so that we can, you know, share notes again. Thereby aligning yourself with the person that you're sharing notes with, Nice Guy Community, just so you're aware how this works. Because I know every time I go to a conference and I'm the speaker at a conference, I always uh, check the barometer of my audience out there by asking how many people are on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn. It, it's not a huge per- percentage of people, even still, that are that are on Twitter or that they have a big following. So when you start to find other people that do it, all of a sudden, now you have something in common with them. Uh, you're both sharing the same conference hashtag. A hashtag will align you with other people that are talking about the same subject as you. Again, Alex, you know this. I'm just kind of educating the nice guy community that's Absolutely, out there. Absolutely, yeah. And then, uh, and then this online relationship, especially if you're at a conference, can always lead to, hey, why don't we go grab a cup of coffee, or why don't we talk, or why don't we figure out what we, what else that we can do together, bam, there your project starts, your network starts, and another referral opportunity from that person. Is that how you do it, or am I off that's, base? That's exactly what happens. Typically, you know, after, you know, liking a few of their posts or retweeting a few posts, Usually, I'll try interacting with them, and I'll say, "Hey, during the coffee break, let's let's meet." And uh, what ends up happening is a lot of times, actually, now, especially now that I, I pretty much live tweet every single thing I go to. Uh, typically, my average amount of tweets a day when I'm at a conference is somewhere around 300 uh, tweets a day. Yeah, it's great, and and those that are in the community that that may not understand the importance of what of what Alex is doing. Again, you do not have to be the person that is making the putting the 300 tweets out there. You nope. could be you could be tweeting 10 times. If you see Alex tweeting 300 times, you know automatically this guy is an influencer at this conference. It's amazing. I just I went to a conference called um, the Collegiate Entrepreneurial Organization in Tampa, Florida, and uh, I probably probably tweeted maybe 50 times while I was there at that for that one day conference for my part and I overtook 
the whoever it was that was that was tweeting. And what's so great about it is then the people that are at the conference using that same hashtag, they see you as the expert at that conference, even if you're not the expert or even organizing the conference. It's amazing. Most uh, of the quotes are not mine. <laughs> right, right. Most of the, right. All Alex is doing, not all, but what he is doing is he's doing transcription. Yeah. And and not in a not in a demeaning way or not in a way that's simple. What he's doing is he's providing value to the other people that are at the conference. So increasing his online exposure, uh, increasing his offline networking capabilities, it's brilliant and it's something that anybody can do. Alex just figured out how to make a business out of it. You also don't have to be at the conference to do it. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> um, right. There are a lot of conferences, um, you know, in our industry alone, there's probably 20 conferences a year at, at minimum. And I can't afford to go to all of them. I don't have the time to go to all of them. But a lot of them will uh, broadcast their keynotes or certain sessions online for free or for a very small fee. And so if I know that you know there's a conference going on and there's a keynote that's going to happen, I'll go on and I will just you know take a 30-minute break or an hour break watch the keynote, use the hashtag, and get in the conversation. I can't tell you how many times I've had people reach out to me on Twitter and say, hey, um, I'd love to meet you at the conference. Can we meet up right. for a drink later? And I have to be like, I'm, I'm not DC, there. Not there. <laughs> um, but what happens is we end up running into each other at other conferences or they reach out to me to connect after the conference. Um, so you don't even have to be at a conference to do this strategy. <laughs> now, and Alex, just so you know, Nice Guy Community, Alex, this is what he does uh, as a business, but as a networker, as a conference attender, if you ever go, uh, attendee, if you ever go to any of these things on your own, you can uh, find these people that are at your conference, or you could be that person, even with a small, it's just amazing how, how few people actually get thoroughly involved in the tweeting aspect of a conference. And you might think, well, it's not going to really get me anywhere. It does. I, I'm always surprised. I pick up five to ten new uh, prospective leads out of every conference by being a speaker at the conference and, and just tweeting. And I'm not even going to the conference. I'm just a guy that's there for 40 minutes, but I happen to – I like to, to kind of get involved with the conference a little bit. It is, it is very cool. And one of the best things that ever happened to me was at a conference um, – there was someone who was looking for someone to have dinner with and it was essentially became an orphan's dinner and he put out on Twitter. Uh, he was a speaker at the conference. He put out on Twitter, Hey, we'd like to, uh, plan an orphan's dinner. Who's in. And, uh, we've got 10 seats at the table and he had planned this and he put out before the, or he called at the restaurant before even going to the conference and uh, reserved a table for 10 at this restaurant in the back room. And uh, and basically 10 people, he reached out to certain people who were tweeting using the hashtag. And we all got together and we had dinner one night. And it was amazing to talk to these people who we, we had been following and seeing their tweets throughout the conference and actually just sit down and have a dinner together. Um, yeah, so, it's kind of like a mastermind group. Exactly. And it, 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 there are ways to take what happens digitally and convert that into face-to-face -face interaction. I, I love that. And and that is just such an amazing story that, that you can tell in practical nature. It happens. It can happen every time that you go to a conference. It's not, what are we going to be doing tonight? Is You have to make shit happen in your life. And this is a great way to do it, especially you're already there and you're working. And even if you aren't there, like Alex says, you can find, find out what the industry conferences are. Certainly, it's great to go because the personal experience is always great. But uh, even if you're just doing it online, you can still have a great experience and Alex is uh, is a great example of, uh, of someone that's done that. Um, I want to move to another subject because I, I think that that while that is certainly a relatable subject online and offline networking for people I want to I want to talk about you as a business owner for a second if we could yeah absolutely what um, what secrets because you know I didn't at first I was going to put you in your your mid to your mid 20s so now now I know that you're <laughs> you're 30 now Alex and you're the old man at 30 what secrets though would you tell the 50 year old version of you you know I um when I had this idea for what I wanted to do, I originally tried to sell it to a couple companies. I pitched it to a consulting agency thinking, well, they're not 
doing this in the event space. They're not doing social media, but they are doing rebranding and other things for conferences. So I figured if I could somehow get them to agree to bring me on and manage this, uh, you know, division of mm-hmm. their company, uh, then I'd already have a built-in base of clients. And so I thought, okay, that's probably the most uh, efficient way to get this company started and this idea started. And when they, at first they seemed very excited, and then they didn't. And, <laughs> and they were like, this just isn't the right time for us, it doesn't seem like there's a need for this. But from my experience in the industry and the people who I had talked to and just from attending conferences and seeing that even the best conferences out there, like Dreamforce, which is 170,000 people, um, they're still missing certain elements of their social media strategy that are just low-hanging fruit. I realized that all conferences need this and it, it really is something that there's a potential audience for. So... I thought to myself, I said, why am I trying to sell this idea to someone else when I could just do it myself? And it was a risk that I knew I was going to have to take if I wanted to succeed. Because I didn't think there would be anyone else who was going to buy into this idea. I mean that that's a great that's a great story. So I'm thinking that the what you would tell the 50 year old you is is uh, it, I'm glad you acted so soon on the self employment thing because uh, I mean you could have spent an an inordinate amount of time uh, just trying to court businesses that don't have um, this particular service in their uh, in their you know in their bag of tricks and, and maybe eventually given up and it it sounds like you realize quick pretty quickly that you needed to go do this on your own because the job that you had be- right before you uh, you started your own thing you weren't there very long not because you guys didn't get along but because I think you were just itching to get to get this self employment thing going. You know, I I was doing I was director of marketing for a technology company, and what I realized very quickly was, although I loved and a lot of what I did as director of marketing was social media strategy for the company, but what I realized very quickly was that wasn't my passion. I didn't want to do it just for a company. I really wanted to be part of the strategy behind social media for a conference. Mm-hmm. Uh, the technology conf or technology company was in the conference space, but I wasn't actually doing anything for the conference. I was just marketing this company, and that wasn't satisfying to me. Um, I wanted to have an impact on the attendees. When did you realize that being a goal setter, because you had to have, you had, to have had these goals kind of set in your mind, uh, when did you realize that goal setting was something that you were actually good at? Because... I still haven't figured that part out. <laughs> I mean, you you kind of have have uh, have beat most people to that punch and being and being good at it. You you really did throw caution to the wind a couple of times in your in your career early on and just said, "I'm going to just do this. I I'm going to do it." How did you get? How did you put the goals in front of your fears? You know, it probably. It goes all the way back to when I was in high school. The high school that I attended was a technology magnet uh, school. And basically what that meant was you, after lunch, halfway through the day, would go hop on a bus and drive a few miles down the road to this technology center. And you picked a major and uh, you took specific classes in that major. And all of your electives in high school were essentially in this major. And initially... (laughs) funny thing is initially my um my major choice was hotel restaurant and tourism okay um, i now have a master's degree in tourism so i could have just you know gone right there <laughs> <laughs> but um but about i guess towards the end of my freshman year when you could still change your major um i my sister had gone off to um, film school or she was heading on her way to film school and she calls me up probably the first week of sophomore year when she was a freshman in film school and she goes I know what you should be doing and it's not this hotel restaurant thing yeah. that you think that you think you want to do um, you should be doing film and you should be doing set design because I've been very active in theater I was going to theater camp and I seem to like it I like to build things up I was very creative so she said this is what you should be doing so I bought a book read it front to back in one weekend about set design for film 
and I changed my major major the next day. Oh boy! <laughs> I realized very quickly was that for me, if I find something that I'm passionate about, um, I'm going to succeed. It doesn't matter what it is. That's a the, that's a great the thing. Second, the second that and so I it, that's why I jumped right into it. I said, okay, yeah, this this is. I love doing this for theater. I think it'd be great for film. I read that book. I became passionate about it, and I went for it. Um, no one else, and I changed my major to construction and manufacturing. <laughs> everyone, else, everyone else in that program was studying to be an architect. Uh, I was studying to design sets for film. <laughs> Interesting. So, so I learned AutoCAD and things like that in high school. But to you know, your sophomore year when you're 15, 16 years old, to make a decision of what your future is going to be and really invest in that, um, it takes a lot of foresight. No, I, so I, I, I goal setting has always, you know, been something that I've had to think about about the future because I've been doing it for so long. Uh, what's what's so fun working with you? Because we've worked on a couple of projects together. One of them with this live stream at the last um, uh, Mace, which is our our local chapter, Nice Guy Community. It's our local chapter um, conference. Um, we worked on a project specifically. And what I like about you in the decision making process, you kind of like you're an old soul. I mean, you're young minded, but you kind of get the old school ways. Uh, now, like who shared you? You have to learn that from somebody. You just can't come by that naturally, or maybe you did. How did you? How did that? How did you understand that that's kind of how you need to, to, to deal with you know, people of all ages in that old school mentality? Uh, probably from my parents. Uh, my mom and my dad. Uh, my dad owns a law firm. Uh, he has since he was very young. And my mom helped him build that company uh, from the ground up. And uh, the way that my dad got that started was, you know, he got let go of a job. And... Uh, they had a choice. He could either go work for someone else or build his own company. And so probably from a very young age, I was taught, you know, these ideas of entrepreneurship and knowing who your audience is and, and knowing who the right people are to connect with and taking, you know, into consideration all different people from all walks of life. And uh, so I, I think from a very early age, I was, I was taught to consider those things. Interesting. And, and you do it and you do it really well. Um, I want to get to a, a part of our show where we um, it's called the rapid fire portion where I'm going to ask you five questions. I, I don't nice guy community, just so you're aware, I don't uh, talk to the um, to the guests that are coming on the show about the five because I want their knee jerk response. And, and Alex, <laughs> I'm going to give you like like 20 seconds to respond. I'm going to do my best, although I usually screw this part up. I'm going to do my best not to add any uh, uh, contributing words onto uh, onto each one of these as you do it so we can just uh, kind of breeze through it. But are you are you up for the game of uh, the rapid fire Q&A? I'm ready. All right, let's go. Let's go. All right, uh, be relatable, Alex. Um, what do you suck at? Oh, uh, working in the mornings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am a night owl through and through, and uh, that's that's one of the benefits of working for yourself. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally agree. All right, be uh, be transparent. Uh, how did you pay your bills when you first got going recently? Um, uh, uh, initially, I was on unemployment. Um, so until I got my first client paycheck or, you know, my first check from a client, I was on unemployment. Okay. Uh, be confident. Uh, what do you do as an entrepreneur that's, uh, as good as it gets? As good as it gets? Probably the networking in person and making sure that I'm present and visible at every event, you know, industry event that I go to. Yeah. I, and I would agree with that. Uh, be humble. What experts did you need to call upon to make shit happen when shit wasn't happening? <laughs> uh, my sister, she works for Dreamforce. Uh, she has an MBA and she used to be a consultant. So I figured who better to consult me than a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a good plan. And uh, last one, be realistic. Um, where are you going to be in 90 days and uh, how far into the future do you think you can see? So in 90 days, um, I am actually in two weeks going to be completing my first uh, – big client event uh, up in New York at Javits Center um, called the Hotel Experience. So it'll be my first client event that I have executed through the event. And then uh, and then I'm going to be speaking at two conferences uh, in January, um, the Professional Convention Management Association and an event called The Special Event. Um, 
so hopefully i'll have more business <laughs> yeah that's that's very true and how far into the future can you uh can you see do you think i i, I have a i have pretty lofty goals um i would like to be the agency that conferences that associations and corporations come to to develop and execute their social media strategies and that includes everything and anything that is new to what that means whether that be live streaming shows live tweeting um developing marketing content customer service you name it i want to do it nice and i'm looking forward to working on some of those uh some of those projects uh, with you as well you, you're a creative soul not only an old soul but you're a creative soul as well we, we came up with some uh pretty funky ways in which to gaff tape wire and, <laughs> and hodgepodge uh, our project together but you know what it came across as professional and everybody seemed to love it it was like the hit of uh of our little old conference that we put together last year um especially Spend a moment, if you would, and just answer uh, one or two more personal questions, and then we'll uh, we'll conclude the interview. Can I uh, can I run a personal question by you? Absolutely. All right, great. Do you have your uh, cell phone anywhere near you? My cell phone? Yes. Okay, great. Do you have an iPhone <laughs> or something inferior? An iPhone. Of course. <laughs> All right, go to your picture app. What is the last photo that you took? The last photo that I took was at uh, a hockey game. Uh, I'm a huge uh, Washington Capitals fan. Okay. So, uh, and go to your texting app. What is the last text you sent and received, or received, and not the one that I sent you on Skype saying I'm going to be a few minutes late? <laughs> uh, asking my mom what health insurance I should be signing up for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. See, that's. Oh, I'm still asking my mom for advice too, so it's good. And what what was her answer? Just curious. <laughs> Uh, no answer yet. She said, "Email me the list, and oh, I'll boy. take a look." Oh boy! All right. So, give me some uh, some parting words of wisdom that you can impart upon the uh, the uh, the nice guy community, Alex, as they go about their uh, their day now. Yeah, you know, we talked a lot about networking. Just don't be afraid to be yourself. Uh, get out there. Uh, talk to the right people. One of the things at the very first conference I went to uh, was I saw at one of the parties that they had one night, um, the new CEO of the association, he had just started and it was his first conference as CEO. And I was a student and it was my first conference that I had been to and I decided to go up and introduce myself. And he was incredibly impressed with the fact that I was a student and I wasn't afraid to go and have a conversation with him. And we have been friends ever since. Every event that I go to, I see him and we, you know, I know his wife now and he's a great guy. And it's because I wasn't afraid to go up and introduce myself. I love um, it. So just open your mouth. Nice guy community. That's all you need to do. Is that is that a good uh, is that a good ending statement? Absolutely. All right. All right. So Alex Plaxon, president and founder of Little Bird Told Media. Thanks again for being on the show today. We'll make sure we give uh, all of Alex's contact information uh, on the show notes. Don't forget to hit the little recommend button so uh, Overcast can see that you actually like us. That would be good. And uh, Alex, thanks again for, uh, for being a part of the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Nice guy community. Never underestimate the, uh, the power of nice. Special thanks again to Alex Plaxon and Steve O'Brien. Go ahead and take us out of here. Call 4242-DJ-DUG and record an intro for the show to hear on a future episode. Say anything you want. Hell, take my job. I'm getting sick of these guys anyway. We still rolling? Don't tell him I said that. <laughs>